Happy morning to you, saints. Welcome to Peace Baptist Church. This Wednesday is the beginning of our Lenten season. Join us at 7 p.m. for our Ash Wednesday service in the Cyber Sanctuary. We need your help. The Veteran Support Ministry is in need of supplies to support United States Services organizations at three local airports. Please drop off the listed supplies to the church no later than March 30th. The 712 Youth will have Friday Night Fellowship on February 25th at 7 p.m. Test your knowledge with Black History Bingo! The Evan Smith Institute is now open for enrollment into the spring semester. Our very own Rev. Dr. E. Faith Bell will be teaching Ethics and Essential Leadership Skills. If you are interested, please call the church office. There are also scholarships available. Classes will begin on March 8th, so reserve your space today. We will continue to have prayer at noon on Monday through Friday except Wednesdays. On Wednesday, we will continue to have Bible study at noon and prayer call at 1 p.m. Please dial 727-731-4642. We hope to hear you on our next prayer call. To pay tithes, offering, or make a donation, you may visit us online at pbc712.org forward slash giving. And you can also download the Givelify app and search for Peace Baptist Church. As you continue to give diligently, please note that our cash app is currently down. We will update you when the issue has been resolved. As always, we thank you for your contributions to our ministry. For all of our events and more information, please visit our website at pbc712.org. You may view our calendar or announcements to learn more. This concludes our announcement. Thank you for joining us in the Cyber Sanctuary. We hope that you and your families are staying safe. And remember, little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Happy Valentine's Day. Who am I with the 712 Youth? We hope you enjoy learning about black musicians. I was born on June 7th in Washington, D.C. I began piano lessons at the age of five after it was discovered that I had a natural ear for music. I grew up performing and singing groups in various bands, also playing in church which has given me a well-rounded performance base of various genres of music. I was accepted in the Fine Arts program at McKinley Senior High School in Washington, D.C. I went on from there to major in music at Howard University. I was the first female admitted in a jazz studies program by auditioning for the founder of the program, Arthur Dawkins. While in college, I began recording in New York for Vanguard Records. It was there that I was able to sign a deal with Atlantic Records in conjunction with United Artists Productions. One of my songs reached as high as number 25 in the United States on the Billboard Top 40. I am an accomplished pianist, singer, and composer. I have performed in such places as Constitution Hall, the Apollo Theater, Howard Theater, and the Roseland, ballroom of New York City. Upon returning to Washington, D.C., I began playing for various churches in the area. I have built many programs and have been a consultant for various church programs, performing and conducting as well as arranging music in the sacred form. I have also taught high school music for the past 13 years with a great love to pass on the knowledge and opportunities that I have been given. The past year, I have attended Howard University for postgraduate in the field of jazz performance, piano, and voice. My philosophy is ear training, sight reading, and harmony analysis will give the student a firm foundation in music, but having fun while doing it is best. I have one son and have been enjoying playing for my church for 15 years on and off. Who am I? I'm Gail Freeman.
Let me tell you a little story. I was born on October 9th at Georgetown Hospital in Washington, D.C. I retired after 28 years of being a D.C. firefighter. After retirement, I started my new career in fitness training. My daughter is an accomplished musician, and I wanted to do something musically with her. So I picked up a bass guitar about 10 years ago, and by the grace of God, I taught myself how to play. I currently sing lead with a quartet group called Men of Faith, whom I've been a member of for over 25 years. I also play bass guitar for another quartet group called the Gaston Brothers, and I've been with them over 15 years. I really enjoy singing and I am playing my instrument out of my love for God. I am happily married to my wife of 34 years, and I have two children, a boy and a girl, and I have four grandchildren. Who am I? David Tinsley. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. His amazing grace. I made it this far by the grace of God. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. I made it this far by the grace of God. Lord, I thank you for how you brought me. You brought me through the rain. Lord, you kept me and you never left me. You stood by my side. Oh, there were so many times when I felt so weak. Oh, man, death, he tried to take me in. So the reason I'm here is not hard for you to see. It's so easy, it's so easy for me to say it was God's grace. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. His amazing grace. God's grace. I made it this far. Good morning, peace. I greet you in the name of none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray this morning that you are joining our cyber sanctuary healthy and well. I'm honored to share with you in our virtual worship experience today. And I'd like to thank our pastor, Reverend Dr. Michael T. Bell, for this opportunity. So without further delay, let's jump into the word. If you'll join me in reading our text for today that comes from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. Revelation 2, 1 through 5, which reads as follows. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know now your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. 
I'd like to submit for your consideration briefly this morning the topic, Finding a Lost Love. Today is Valentine's Day, and I'm sure if you turn on the radio, you will hear one of the uh, genres of music played on almost every type of station, whether rock, R&B, country, or oldies. All of them will likely have on their playlist today a variation of the classic love song. From the groups of Motown to the crooning of some old Luther Vandross to Today, some lyrics will speak to the joys of love, others of unrequited love, and yet others address what to do when love has run its course. In terms of the latter, you may remember one such song from the late 70s whose lyrics include... Something happened along the way, what used to be happy was sad. Something happened along the way, and yesterday was all we had. Oh, after the love has gone, what used to be right is wrong. Can love that's lost be found? While Earth, Wind, and Fire was undoubtedly referring to that of a broken romantic relationship, those who are willing to touch the boundaries of authenticity today may even admit to feeling that way about their relationship with God now. It may be difficult or even embarrassing to admit that your relationship with God isn't anywhere near where it used to be, should be, could be, or where you want it to be. You've got the Bible memorized such that you could pass the catechism questioning better than any ordained preacher or deacon. You know the words to every song the choir sings. 104.1 is locked as the first saved channel on your car radio. Sunday Best is scheduled on your DVR each week. You don't miss church school. And during this pandemic, you've made sure to log online at 945 just to make sure you have no problems making it to 10 a.m. service on time. From all outward appearances, your relationship with God is just fine. And if it is, that's great. Then sit back and pray for the rest of us as we get through this message because there are some in the cyber sanctuary right now who are all churched out, even from the comfort of their homes, wondering why they even logged on this morning. Some who have committed their life to Christ, who know they are saved and have done everything they've been asked to do on this often challenging journey, and yet log off Sunday after Sunday feeling like something is off. When others around you worship with energy, with singing, you, they are a friend of God, declaring how great God is and that his blood still works. And yet, as soon as the music stops playing and the choir stops singing and the preacher stops shouting, there's a silence in your spirit and a, a missing peace you feel in your soul and you're left yearning to hear God's voice again with some clarity and feel his touch again with the same sensitivity you used to. You can't help but reflect on the fact that something happened along the way. And the question now is, can what was lost still be found? The focus of our letter today is the church at Ephesus. It was uh, the greatest city in the Roman province of Asia. This church was, or, or this area, was an important commercial center with major trade routes, shipping harbors, and it was a thriving cultural center. Around 52 AD, the Christian faith uh, was ushered into the city through Paul, who was assisted by Priscilla and Aquila. And throughout his travels, Paul continued to stop in the city, one time remaining there for more than two years, and both Timothy and John pastored for a time. Time. So this church had the distinction of being in closer interaction and under the leadership of some of the greatest teachers of the faith at the time. In other words, they were very familiar with what they should be doing. They promoted sound doctrine, and in the book of Acts, we see them standing up to those that built statues of false gods. But that passion didn't last for long, for they quickly forgot their first love. 
That wasn't evident necessarily from the outside, though. According to the text, they were faithful servants. They uh, hated evil and opposed false doctrine. They worked diligently and consistently in the ministry and practiced discipline. Their work spoke for them, and they persevered in everything they did for the sake of God. Yet, at the end of the commendation for doing such a good job, there's still a nevertheless. Verse 4 says, Says, nevertheless, this is what I have against you. You do not love me now as you first did. He goes on to say in verse 5, If you don't turn from your sins, I will come to you and take your lampstand from its place. Here are folks who seem to be doing the right thing, and yet God is still angry with them, so much so that he threatens to take away their church standing. In order to understand why God was so disappointed in this church, we must understand what God meant when he said, you do not love me now as you first did. The Ephesians seem like they love God, but the kind of love God was referring to isn't what they were giving. There, there was a missing element to the relationship that was most likely rooted in works because God said, return to your first work. Most of you are familiar with the three primary words that, that are used in Greek for love. Uh, there's eros, which is romantic, and there is Filio, which is representative of brotherly love and affection. And, and there's lastly, agape, which is used in this text. And it's an expression of deep and constant unconditional love that fosters the practical expression through action. This love isn't simply an emotion or a thought process, or it's not only performing random acts of kindness as works. Truth be told, you can feel a whole host of emotions that mimic love, but without the intentionality of choice, fail to actually love. You can perform acts of kindness with a selfish motive, but when you love as God commands, there is a spirit of complete and total servitude toward the Creator that stands ready to act in love love in all situations. Just as faith without works is dead, works without love are meaningless. Paul phrases it this way in 1 Corinthians 13, 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love for God is inextricably linked to our love for his people and can be measured by our love for our fellow man. Why question why there is such apathy in our communities, why it's easier to get behind social media campaigns in the safety and comfort of our homes behind a computer without taking the march to the streets, why it's easier to write a check to charity rather than packing lunches and handing them out on the street, why it's easier to say, not my problem, not my issue, not my people. Well, if it is, then perhaps we ought to each take the time out and take a personal inventory of our own relationship with God because we simply cannot love God without actively showing that same love toward our brothers and sisters in creation. If our relationship is right with God, then the love we manifest with others takes into account every single aspect of 1 Corinthians 13, the patience, kindness, gentleness, no envying or boasting. It becomes so much a part of your heart and who you are that it simply isn't just a character trait. It's part of your very being such that your passion incites you to act fervently with whatever God calls you to do. And no person, no circumstance is going to keep you from it. While the Ephesians did have some good points on their scorecard, it was all negated by the fact that the reason they were doing it was missing. Their love for God had burnt out. They needed to return to their first works that manifested that love. Love must not rely on feeling, but on foundational faith.
We often use the expression falling in love to signify the deep affection we have for someone. We sing, falling in love with Jesus was the best thing I've ever done. But because this phrase, the phrase falling in love, seeks to romanticize the subject to which it refers, it can also be terribly misleading. Contrary to the popular expression, any love worth having isn't just fallen into. The word falling implies a sudden movement or swift descent without the opportunity for correction or choice. Therefore, falling indicates that you have absolutely no control over your actions. This term then takes away all aspect of personal responsibility for the love relationship. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, in response to being asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus replied, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Notice that this isn't an option. It's not a feeling that's expected to come and to go. This is a commandment, which means that it's something that you have free will or choice to do, but is expected of you by God. Unfortunately, though, sometimes our pattern of expressing our love to God follows the pattern of broken human relationships. If God doesn't do something we think he ought to do, we may disengage and stop praying and stop listening or stop going to church. If we don't hear God's answer in a timely manner, we may lose hope and our faith may become strained. Eventually, our pain at unfulfilled expectation turns into anger and we disconnect or withdraw or lash out until what was once the object of our passion becomes a burden rather than a joy. Or maybe our love changes because we've come so comfortable, we've become so comfortable that we feel that we don't need to put in any extra effort. Or like human relationships, we become accustomed to routine and don't feel the need to wait on God anymore with a sense of expectancy and excitement. The text doesn't provide detailed specifics about what led to the disconnect at the church of Ephesus, but whatever the case, it does offer hope of resolution. The formula for rectifying a broken relationship is given very simply in verse 5, and that is remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work. Remember, repent and do. It doesn't require much elaboration. Remember simply remains to think back to what it was like when you first entered into relationship with Christ. Think of the joy and excitement. Remember knowing that you could do anything with his power that worked within you. Remember feeling that you were uh, being used and God was giving you gifts and you could contribute to the body. Romans 12, 2 tells us that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds, which is a daily process, not a one-time thing. As you remember, ask God to help you think on that which is good and discard that which is negative. Ask God to help you recall the joy that you had when you first entered into relationships. Remembrance ensures the standard you seek to reach in relationship is set from a place that you've already experienced and is familiar and you have been successful in. Then comes repentance. Repentance is not simply an expression of regret. True repentance is a confession of sin supported by a life-changing action that provides evidence of the change. In other words, telling God you're sorry your relationship is distant isn't enough if you can't change the reasons it occurred in the first place. For example, if you've identified a specific sin, confess it, and then intentionally shut all the doors possible to it so that it doesn't re-enter. If you've identified a lack of nourishment or discipline as an example, then repentance should be evident by you re-implementing those same dis disciplines consistent with worship or prayer life or whatever they may be. Whatever you turn from, you must also walk in opposite direction and not go back. 
which gives you the opportunity to do the last thing, which is to redo. Redoing means taking advantage of a clean slate to start over again. Do what you did in the beginning that worked after you cast out what obviously didn't. Make a vow to trust God again despite what your past says. Redoing is the opportunity for a fresh start without the baggage of mistakes and missteps. Doing the work you did at first means doing what, not what is expected of you or not doing what everyone wants you to do, but going back and participating in that which brought you such life in the first place in your ministry. Too often we get caught in the rut of expectation rather than acting upon the revelation that God has given to us for our role and what he wants us to do. If you're spinning your wheels and tiring yourself out because you're doing something that someone other than God called you to do or something you're doing just because no one else is stepping up to the plate, stop and reconsider and maybe heed the advice of Howard Thurman who said it best when he said, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do it because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The very things that made you come alive at the beginning of your relationship with God are the very things that God put in you as your gifts to be used to benefit the body of Christ. Rediscover the joy that comes from exercising those unique gifts God gave to you that were meant to be shared through love from him with love to the world. As I close, I'm reminded of a story I read not long ago about an elderly man. And it was a busy morning when this man arrived at his doctor's appointment at 8.30 in the morning. And he arrived very early. He was in a hurry and he made it clear to the receptionist that his appointment was at 9 and he needed to get in and be seen right away. Time passed by and the man clearly got more and more restless. Finally, a nurse took him into the back room and as she removed the stitches that were in his hand, she asked if he had another doctor's appointment since he was in such a hurry. The gentleman told her no, that he needed to get to the nursing home to eat breakfast with his wife as he does every single morning. The nurse asked incredulously, you mean you are in all this hurry just so you can get to the nursing home? Is your wife going to be worried because you're late? Is that why you're in such a rush? No, the man replied. She no longer knows who I am, you see. She has Alzheimer's. She doesn't even recognize me. The nurse was even more surprised and said, you mean you still go every morning even though she has no idea who you are? The man smiled and patted the nurse's hand and said, she may not know me, but I still know who she is. No matter what causes a disconnect in our relationship with God, the fact remains that God never loses our love for us and he never forgets us. Don't beat yourself up or let anyone else guilt you or label you as a bad Christian or backslidden Christian. You're not going to lose your salvation, which was given by grace. And quite frankly, you're not feeling anything that others on this journey haven't felt at some point. Point in their lives. Even when we can't see God's from whether it's depths of despair or through the haze of sin or the comfort of complacency, God still stands with outstretched arms waiting to accept us back home. That's where hope lies. When John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He was letting us know that his love covers a multitude of sins and that that love secured our future and our future has been sealed because of God's love. God gave the greatest sacrifice for our lives, not out of kindness, not out of a feeling, not out of an obligation, but out of a love so ingrained in his character that he's defined by it, for God is love.
So no matter how far you've fallen, no matter how separated you may have become, no matter how far away you may feel from God and feel as if that love has gone, it's only a matter of remembering, repenting, and redoing to reach out and reclaim your lost love. God bless you, peace. May God continue to smile upon you. May God continue to keep you. And may God continue to protect you. In the name of Jesus, we thank God for today. We thank God for you and your presence. And we thank you for joining us here in the Cyber Sanctuary. Happy Valentine's Day. Amen. comes and goes but few people really know what it means to really love somebody love though the tears may fade away I'm so glad you're show me Jesus what
Happy morning to you, saints. Welcome to Peace Baptist Church. This Wednesday is the beginning of our Lenten season. Join us at 7 p.m. for our Ash Wednesday service in the Cyber Sanctuary. We need your help. The Veteran Support Ministry is in need of supplies to support United States Services organizations at three local airports. Please drop off the listed supplies to the church no later than March 30th. The 712 Youth will have Friday Night Fellowship on February 25th at 7 p.m. Test your knowledge with Black History Bingo! The Evan Smith Institute is now open for enrollment into the spring semester. Our very own Rev. Dr. E. Faith Bell will be teaching Ethics and Essential Leadership Skills. If you are interested, please call the church office. There are also scholarships available. Classes will begin on March 8th, so reserve your space today. We will continue to have prayer at noon on Monday through Friday except Wednesdays. On Wednesday, we will continue to have Bible study at noon and prayer call at 1 p.m. Please dial 727-731-4642. We hope to hear you on our next prayer call. To pay tithes, offering, or make a donation, you may visit us online at pbc712.org forward slash giving. And you can also download the Givelify app and search for Peace Baptist Church. As you continue to give diligently, please note that our cash app is currently down. We will update you when the issue has been resolved. As always, we thank you for your contributions to our ministry. For all of our events and more information, please visit our website at pbc712.org. You may view our calendar or announcements to learn more. This concludes our announcements. Thank you for joining us in the Cyber Sanctuary. We hope that you and your families are staying safe. And remember, little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Happy Valentine's Day.